Riding the coattails of the Industrial Revolution, the dawn of the 20th century saw continued invention and the development of our modern industry. It's only through hindsight we are truly able to see the damage wrought when innovation and industry collides with our lack of understanding of the dangers of our world. What is truly terrifying is when those dangers are ignored and profit is deemed more important than human lives. Today we'll be exploring radium and how a so-believed miracle mineral went from an essential panacea to ultimately destroying the lives of those exposed to it. Together we'll be creating a doll while we document the radium industry of the early 20th century, as well as explore how radium's mishandling can impact our bodies through true medical case studies. I'm Etlan, and this is Radium Girl. The doll I'll be using is a prototype design of one of my own, which I haven't shown online yet. I thought that this would make a good opportunity to test out the design in real time. As this doll is still very much in its non-finalized design stage, um, please don't judge too hard. Fresh off the 3D printer, we have half of our parts for the doll, which will need sanding and buffing. While half the doll has been printed in white, the other half of this doll will be printed in a glowing resin. This will be explained later on as to why I went with this decision. I didn't have glowing resin on hand, so thought to craft some myself using glowing resin powder and a clear UV resin used for printers. While in theory and micro practice this worked out well and created an amazing glowing resin, perfect for immediate casting, 3D resin printing takes hours. When doing a practice, I didn't factor in time, so the powder settled at the bottom of the vat when it was printing. As the resin and the powder separated, it resulted in a weak and inconsistent glow. While making a custom resin is a fun idea, it's sometimes best to leave it to the professionals, and ended up buying the Monocure Glow-in-the-Dark resin. For the body, I adapted the chest for a skeletal design. Originally I had adapted one of my doll's heads to create a custom half skull design, but felt it was a bit too grotesque, substituting it instead with one of my own custom heads. In 1898, Marie and Pierre Curie, through tests on uranium ore, discovered the element radium. As well through their research, they discovered uranium and radiation to both be radioactive, a discovery that would revolutionize our world as we know it. But for Marie Curie herself, however, her discovery is now ultimately believed to be the cause of her demise. You see, radiation is all around us. Not all radiation is harmful, its dangers really depend on the type and the amount of exposure. An oversimplified explanation of how radiation can harm us is by looking at atoms of radiation as energy that passes through our body like air through trees. How it can harm us is if we are exposed too much. The radiation while passing through will damage our cells overwhelming our body's natural ability to repair itself. The ignorance of radium's damage on our body was largely due in part to the relatively slow nature of its damage. High levels of radiation exposure could manifest itself in cellular dysfunction or cancers. Marie Curie ultimately died of aplastic anemia, meaning that her body was exposed to high levels of radiation causing her body to lose its ability to make new blood cells, which eventually led to her death. The dangers of radiation from radium was identified just two years after its discovery, however ultimately was not fully understood, or worse, ignored. You see, the thing that drew people to radium, like moths to a flame, was its glow. 
With the First World War underway, there was a demand for luminous dials for soldiers' wristwatches. Entering the market was a paint called Undark, manufactured by a company known as the US Radium Corporation. The mixture of radium carbonate, zinc sulfate, and paint binder made a paint with a continuous glow which served perfectly for watches and clocks. From soldiers' watches grew an excitement for this new invention within the public consciousness, known as radium fever. The invisible energy that was emitted from this luminous material became highly popular amongst the population. It was seen as a panacea, meaning a solution or remedy to all difficulties or diseases. Radium and its glow invoked a feeling of modernity, youth, vitality and represented long life. While radium was being tested within the medical field to see if it could treat things like cancer, tuberculosis, depression and much more, it was in the hands of charlatans and snake oil salesmen, where radium truly seemed to take off in popularity. You see, radium is classified as a natural property, and at the time did not fall under the umbrella of the US Drug and Food Administration Act so manufacturers were allowed free reign on adding radium to really anything to cater to the public's excitement. At its height, you could find radium products in things like toothpaste, children's toys, makeup and face creams. Or, if you prefer, you could just drink it. Yes, radium was also added to water through products like Radithal. Quoting a 1911 magazine article, The invigorating effects of the radium give a pleasant sense of well-being to the radioactivity absorbed by one's body, which is retained for several hours after treatment. Thankfully, in a way, radium water was quite expensive to manufacture which made consuming radium water relatively inaccessible to the average persons, though this didn't stop the rich from indulging in this so-called elixir of life. With the confidence that the product was truly the cornerstone of one's health regime. In addition to the health regime, what about one's beauty regime? Become young again with radium infused face creams and makeup from companies like Radithor's Radium and Beauty and Tho Radia. In a magazine article, Radium and Beauty's night cream was advertised to soften the skin, imparting a delicate bloom to the surface. It vitalizes, energizes, and rejuvenates. That is because the cream contains actual radium. The cream also came with a guarantee that the natural radium will retain their radioactivity for at least 20 years. To keep up with the demand for self-illuminating clocks, factories were developed by the US Radium Corporation. Hiring painters to hand paint dials on clocks, these factories sought a certain demographic for their painters. Seeking out young women and girls as young as 15 to 17 from lower socioeconomic areas. The company touted that small girls have small hands and thus would be perfect for painting tiny numbers. Though retrospectively, it could be argued the company preferred hiring younger workers, eager to support their families as to prey on their inexperience. A clock painter's day would consist of meticulously painting with the expectation of finishing at least 250 dials a day. Sitting at their workbench, the painters were encouraged to place the brush into their mouths and press their lips together to make a sharp point. Pick up the paint, paint the dial and repeat. The brush would constantly be going into the paint, onto the clock, into the mouth. Into the paint, onto the clock, into the mouth. Encouraged to do this under the guise that the paint was perfectly safe. 
the girls became enamoured by the beauty of the luminosity. An account by a radium painter. We would paint our faces up, she said. One girl even painted her teeth. We went into the dark room and made faces at each other. All you would see was the radium. So all you're looking at is eyebrows and moustaches and teeth. There were so many radium painters that it was common to recognise them on the streets, even on the darkest of nights, because the glow around them, their hair sparkled almost like a halo. Eventually, however, the signs of sickness started to emerge. For many, it started with fatigue. They would find themselves constantly tired all the time for no reason. Some would find themselves losing weight. They would notice an ache in their tooth that would stay for days. Soon they would start to feel pain in their jaw, with the pain growing worse and worse. Eventually a tooth would fall out. The tooth looked strange though. It would be honeycombed. Left in place would be a gaping hole that would refuse to heal. Molly Magia was one of the dial painters first affected. She sought help from her doctor, who, when examining her, touched her jaw. It was so fragile it broke in his hand. I wish to spare the gruesome details around the end of Molly's young life, as it's not necessary. All that's needed to know was that Molly's jaw was deemed to be in a state of necrosis, meaning irreversible, an uncontrollable cell death. There was nothing her family or doctors could do but watch as she continued to deteriorate as the necrosis spread and she eventually perished. By 1924, nine more dial painters died under similar circumstances. Around the same time, a wealthy American socialite Eben Byers sought a remedy for an injury to his arm. And just as many did during that time, he turned to the pseudoscience of radium-infused products as a solution. The product prescribed was Radithor, distilled water with radium. The manufacturer claimed Radithor would instill vitality back into whoever who drank it. The product would not only give users a burst of energy but would also be a cure for all ailments. Despite the product being quite expensive, Byers was hooked, finding himself drinking multiple a day, even sharing the product with his horse. Within three years, Byers consumed an approximate of 1,500 bottles of Radithor, only stopping when he found his energy fading over time. While he initially enjoyed the energy boost that came with Radithor, he found he was no longer able to get the same boost, eventually finding himself tired all the time. He started experiencing headaches, and a pain began in his jaw. For the remaining dial painters, a legal investigation was prompted demanding insight into the safety of the paint and an explanation for all the deaths. The company boasted about the safety of the paint and touted that the deaths were a result of the sexually transmitted disease, syphilis. An attempted assassination of character by blaming the painter's illnesses and deaths on the young woman's own supposed sexual promiscuity. Whilst the painters awaited their days in court, Molly Magia's dentist, Dr. Neff, began his own investigation into her death. Neff had hypothesized that Molly had been suffering with an occupational disease. As the necrosis seemed quite similar to Fossey jaw, a necrosis common among matchmakers in the Victorian era. 
I asked the radium people for the formula of their compound, but this was refused, he said. So many other persons were sent to me with almost similar symptoms that I became suspicious and took up the study of radium with an expert. Dr. Neff tested the jaw of Molly that had been removed before her death and through his own findings discovered the bones to be radioactive. Molly was exhumed and taken for further autopsy. The autopsy confirmed Neff's findings that not only Molly's jaw, but her body was highly radioactive and she clearly had not died of syphilis, but a necrosis that was now showing signs in her sisters. But why does it affect the jaw in so many of these painters? You see, when the painters use their mouths to form the point of the brush, the undark paint would inadvertently be ingested. Radium's chemical compound has a similarity to calcium, so has an affinity to latch onto hard tissue. As the first point of contact with the body was through the mouth, the radium would collect in the bones of the face, and in turn the radiation would destroy the cells and in cases morph into cancer. With this evidence the painters won in court, but this victory must have felt little in comparison with the knowledge that just like Molly, they too were in for a long and painful demise. She was my best friend. Before I knew it, she got sick. She had the broken jaw. It never healed. In two years, she was dead. While the Dow painter's plight was well documented through the newspapers and the deaths of countless others mounted, it was only when the rich and the celebrity became sick that a federal investigation was prompted into the dangers of radium products. Despite the evidence, some still believed in the power of radium as a means for good. One doctor proudly stating that the reported deaths are due not to the presence of radium, but rather to a cheap substitute, mesothorium. But what of Evan Byers, you may ask? In 1931, Byers was asked to testify by the Federal Trade Commission into the dangers of radium and give his personal testimony. A lawyer arrived at his home to record his statement. The lawyer is quoted in saying that by his whole upper jaw, excepting the two front teeth, and most of his lower jaw had been removed, and that all remaining bone tissue of his body was disintegrating, and holes were actually forming in his skull. Byers died a year later, laid to rest in a lead-lined coffin. Despite the inquiry into the dangers of radium, and radium subsequently being discontinued in products, by his death was reported to be attributed to cancer, as opposed to acute radiation syndrome, otherwise known as radiation poisoning. The creator of Radathor, William Bailey, stayed steadfast in his creation's safety, touting proudly that the victims were merely misdiagnosed, as well as stating that he has drunk more Radathor than anyone else and feels fine. He died of an aggressive bowel cancer. Twenty years later, he was exhumed and autopsied, and was found that just like Molly, his bones were still highly radioactive. It's hard to find a moral to this story. There was nothing the victims could have done differently that would have spared them. They were just people, people needing work, people seeking help for their ailments, and people just trying to enjoy their lives. Instead, they served as martyrs and represented how some can choose to turn a blind eye to the suffering of others in the pursuit of profit. That some will try bury the truth under mountains of lies. But in the case of radium, no matter the lies, the deceit, the deception, the truth will eventually bubble to the surface, and it will start with an ache in your jaw. 
Ah, she's finally done. Let me know what you think of her in the comments below. This doll has been a huge passion project for me. I've been working on her almost every day for six weeks. You know, not just making the doll, but as well doing the research and the editing and the script writing and all that stuff. A lot of trial and error and so, so many fails. Oh my gosh, I have so many failed parts um, that I've just got in a box. I might make some creepy jars or something with all these, all these failed parts. But it makes it all worth it in the end when it's finished. But yeah, I'm very, very chuffed. It's um, really nice. It's a nice feeling of accomplishment. That and I've been wanting to do a radiation doll for the longest time. It's one of those strange special interests that I have. Um, so it's really, really nice to finally indulge in that a little bit. I'm not too sure when this video will go up. I was hoping for this to be a Halloween doll. Well, that was the whole shtick of it. Um, but right now it is the 29th. Oh my gosh, I'm so behind. <laughs> uh, so cutting it a little bit fine is the understatement of the century. If I make it on time, it's a Halloween doll. If, it, if I don't make it on time, um, just ignore this section. <laughs> but yeah, let me know what you think of her in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe as well. I would really, really appreciate it. Thank you again, as always, to my Patreon supporters and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now.